Okay, so let's go back to the chapter. And we finished up somewhere around here. Reaction mechanisms. Give me a hey, hey, or a thumbs up or a something. Can everybody see that slide that says reaction mechanisms? All right, thanks, Sierra. Perfect. Okay. So something, you know, to think about, and I went over this during the last class, but we're going to go over it again. If you think about all the reactions that you saw way back in general chemistry, right? You looked at A plus B gives you C plus D. You know, you looked at combustion reactions. You look at double replacement reactions, single displacement reactions, metathesis reactions, all these different reactions. And the thing is, you know, sometimes when we just look at a reaction, you know, and I'll just write something down here so we have something to sink our teeth into. If we just look at a reaction, sometimes we can take it at face value and say, you know, this is what's happening. A is combining with B and we're getting two products, C and D. But the thing is, is that many times the over, um, a chemical reaction is not as simple as it looks. Okay, so this is kind of the simple way of me explaining it here. But oftentimes a reaction that you see that you think, okay, well, it's just A plus B gives me C can actually be comprised of little steps. Okay, so there's a bunch of baby steps that make up the overall reaction. And we call those baby steps or those little steps, we call those elementary steps or elementary reactions. And when you add all of the elementary steps together, you end up getting an overall reaction. And the sequence of all those little steps, so every the first step and the second step and whatever, the sequence of all those little baby steps, those elementary steps, we call that the reaction mechanism. Now, again, if you study organic chemistry, next semester or the semester after that or whatever, you're gonna see that reaction mechanisms can be quite involved, but we're only gonna look at um, reaction mechanisms that involve a couple of steps. Now, let me, sh if you're still like not 100% on board with, you, with me, let me give an example of what I mean. If we just examine this reaction right here, two NO plus oxygen gives us two moles of NO2. You look at that reaction, if you think about general chemistry, what could I have asked you? I could have said, hey, you know, do a limiting reactant problem, you know, look at oxidation numbers, things like that, okay? But if we actually do an experiment on this reaction and we measure the concentration of everything that's present in the reaction mixture, what you're going to find is that you're going to detect some N2O2, dinitrogen dioxide, during the reaction. Now, hold, a, hold the phone, you guys, because I don't see, here's my eyeball, okay? There's, a, there's an eyeball looking at this reaction. I don't see any N2O2 in there, but I am detecting it in the reaction. And that is a clue that this reaction that you're looking at right here is actually comprised of more than one baby step or more than one elementary reaction or more than one elementary step. Okay, so it's comprised of more than one step. And what we actually find is that this reaction that I have highlighted in yellow is actually made up of two elementary steps. Now, what's important is that when you add the elementary steps together, you're going to get the overall reaction. But before we add them together, look at the first step. In the first step, two molecules of NO are combining, and look what they're making. They're making N2O2. So that is where the N2O2 that we're detecting during the reaction, that's where the heck that's coming from. Well, what happens to that N2O2, that dinitrogen dioxide, is that it gets consumed as a reactant in the second elementary step. So again, I'm repeating myself here. It was a product in the first reaction or the first elementary step, and it's a reactant in the second. It combines with oxygen to give us two moles of N2O. But look what happens when I tally those up. Anything that's a product on one side and a reactant on the other are going to cancel. So that means that both of the N2O2s cancel out, and that gives us our overall reaction. Okay, and the focus of this section is going to be looking at rate laws with respect to reactions that have that are comprised of elementary steps now before we really dive into it here i want to kind of pause here and look at the mechanism of this reaction right we talked about the orientation of molecules anyhow here's our overall reaction right here this is our overall reaction at the top okay nothing new there here's the mechanism this is the first elementary step and this is the second elementary step Yes, they were on the previous slide. Here I'm just showing them, but I'm also showing these. These are called space filling models, okay? 
So we have the two molecules of NO colliding. They make N2O2, and then that is going to combine with oxygen to give us our two, two molecules of N2O. So again, these two are going to cancel out because, again, the N2O2 is a product in the first step, but it's a reactant in the second step. We call it an intermediate. Okay, we call this an intermediate, intermediate, because it's produced by the reaction, but it's also consumed in the overall reaction, and so it doesn't show up in the overall reaction. Okay, let's look at this in even more detail. It says here, intermediates, as I just said, are species that appear in the mechanism, but not in the overall balanced equation. Okay, so we didn't see the intermediate. Intermediates are always formed in an early step, an early elementary step, and they're going to be consumed in a later step. So again, and I'm repeating myself here, but bear, bears repeating, right? That it's going to cancel out and it's not going to show up in our overall reaction. All right. Now, before we get into this in even more detail, let's talk about something called the molecularity of the reaction. If you looked at the practice exam, uh, you probably noticed that there was a question in there about the molecularity of a reaction. I don't like to use the word simple in chemistry class, but I'll just say that the molecularity of reaction, I think it's kind of a simple concept because it only involves the number of molecules reacting in an elementary step. If you have an elementary step where you have one reactant molecule, okay, um, remember this is reacting, so not the product, so reactants. If you have one reactant, it's called unimolecular. If you have two reactants, it's called bimolecular. And if you have three, it's termolecular, nothing more than that. So that means that both of these steps here, step one and step two, these would be which kind? Could anybody tell me, would these be uni, bi, or termolecular? It's not a trick question. Exactly. Violet says, and Brogan, they both say they're bimolecular. And you're both right. Why? Because there's two reactants here, and there's two reactants here. So both of those are bimolecular reactions. So if you're like, boy, I hope the whole exam is just questions about that. Well, you'll probably nail that one for sure, right? You're gonna, everybody will get 100 on that one. But hey, I'm obliged to ask it. So let's talk a little bit more about molecularity of a reaction. And we're mostly going to be concerned, not always, but well, let me just say we're going to look at a lot of unimolecular and bimolecular reactions. So it says here, unimolecular reaction, okay? The rate law of an elementary step um, is always going to be equal to the rate times, uh, sorry, the rate law of an elementary step. I'm thinking too, too hard here. The rate law for an elementary step is always going to be rate is equal to the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of, of the products. No exponents, so just exponent of one, okay? So that's how we always do it for an elementary step. All right, so you see how the unimolecular here, so we have one reactant, so we just put it to the power of one, okay, so we're done there. And then if we have a bimolecular, depending on if it's, you know, two different molecules or the same molecule twice, doesn't matter, your rate law, it's got to be second, it's got to be second order, okay, so first order for a unimolecular, and it'll be second order overall for a bimolecular. Anyhow, what about writing out a reaction mechanism? I've said this to you already, but here it is in writing that the sum of the elementary steps has to give the overall balanced equation. We saw that already on a couple of slides. And here's something that's really important. What's called the rate determining step. Sometimes I just call this the RDS, okay? The rate determining step should predict the same law, the same rate law that is determined experimentally. This is an extremely important rule for you, okay? This one right here is a huge one. Let's sink our teeth into this again. The rate determining step is gonna give you the same rate law that is determined experimentally, okay? And if you're like, I'm not really unsure, I'm not really sure what that means, Mr. Dion, could you unpack that for me even more? Well, we'll look at some examples um, that'll help us understand what the heck this means, okay? Now, if you're like wondering, what's a rate determining step? There's some great analogies in our textbook. Okay, there's some great um, analogies in our textbook. One of them, the rate determining step, I think is the cattle going through, you know, through the, the, the hole in the fence or something like that. But rate determining step is something that you can use in your everyday language with your friends or loved ones or something. 
because the rate determining step is the slowest step in a sequence of steps that leads to the product formation. How would I use this in everyday language? I would use it like this. You know, let's say you're going somewhere with a group of friends and everybody, you know, is getting ready. Then all of a sudden, you, you know, you have to drive somewhere. Let's, you know, you get in the car, you're all ready to go and you're waiting for everybody else. You know, you're, you're waiting for everybody else. And then you get to your destination and they say, hey, we're late. And then you say, what the hell, man? I wasn't the rate determining step, right? I wasn't the slowest one. I wasn't the one that got us here the slowest. Okay, so the rate determining step is the slowest step in this sequence of steps. Well, let's look at a problem here and see how we can apply. Oh, I'm way ahead here. Let's see if we can apply our knowledge in this practice problem. It says the gas phase decomp or decomposition of nitrous oxide is believed to occur via two elementary steps. So look at this. The decomposition is a, is a two-step process. So this is proceeding by a, by a reaction mechanism. We have step one and step two. Okay. In step one, you have nitrous oxide decomposing to give you N2 and O. Now, if I want to determine the rate law for an elementary step, it's always going to be really simple. It's going to be the rate for this reaction is going to be equal to K1 times the concentration of N2O. Same thing for the second one. I have my N2O plus this oxygen. Adam gives you nitrogen and oxygen. So the rate law for this one would be rate is equal to K2 times N2O and O. Now that's not what they're asking for, but I wanted to go over that with you before we tackle the questions. It says here that the rate law experimentally is determined to be this. Now look at this. This rate law was determined, ex experimentally measured, you know, they determined it through a series of experiments that it's first order with respect to nitrous oxide. Now you notice that it's the same as this one right here. So we're gonna address that in a second. But the first thing I wanna answer is question A. It says, write the equation for the overall reaction. Could anybody tell me what I would do to write the equation for the overall reaction here? And it's not a trick question. What, what should my steps be? I have the two elementary steps. What would I do if I wanna get the overall reaction? So somebody says, take away oxygen. Cross out the intermediates. Yeah, so it cross out intermediates, but what, how, how am I doing that? Okay, how am I just crossing it out? It's because I'm doing what? So everybody's saying, start canceling stuff out. You're in the right vein, but if we back up here, okay, it says the sum, okay? The sum of the elementary steps must give the overall balanced equation. So you're all in the right vein by saying, you need to cancel something out, Mr. Dion, okay? You've got an intermediate here, right? It shows up on both sides, so that's gonna cancel. But how did you know how to do that? Because like Lauren says, you're adding the same, you're adding the equation. So we're gonna add these equations together. And when we do that, yes, this oxygen atom is gonna cancel because it's a product in the first step and it's a reactant in the second step. So what do we get overall? We get this, we get two, Nitrous oxide produces two molecules of nitrogen plus O2. So that is the overall reaction. Two N2O gives you two N2 plus O2. And again, we add them together, right? So the sum of the elementary steps gives you the overall reaction. Identify the intermediate. I think we already did that. So when we identify the intermediate, we said it's the oxygen. So the oxygen is the intermediate. Okay, and if we go back in our slides, just a little bit here, we go back to the, where was it, my intermediate. The intermediate is formed in an early elementary step, and then it get consumed later on. And that's what we see in this example. The oxygen was formed here, and it gets consumed here. So that's the intermediate. And then lastly, it says, what can you say about the relative rates of, of um, steps one and steps two? Well, let me back up again, okay? Because 
back here in our slides, it says the rate determining step is going to predict the same rate law that is determined experimentally. So if I go back here, the experimentally determined rate law was what? It's right here. I'm just going to write it down again. So rate is equal to K times the concentration of N2O. And we said that the rate determining step should predict the experimentally determined rate law. So I told you that for an elementary step, you can just write the rate law out like this. So that tells us that since our experimentally determined rate law is the exact same as this one here, that tells us that step one must be the rate determining step. So we'll write that down. Step one must be must be rate determining step since rate determining step should so again the step one has to be or step one is the rate determining step because the rate determining step should predict the experimentally determined rate law. And that is the answer, my friends. There we go. All right. So step one is definitely slower. Absolutely. Step one is the, this is the rate determining step. Remember, the rate determining step is the slowest, slowest step. Something that you'll see if you look at the practice problems is sometimes it'll just tell you, you know, this reaction is fast, this reaction is slow, and that's the information they'll give you. And then you have to recognize, you know, well, the slowest step is, you know, that's the rate determining step. There we go. Well, I want to show you a specific example of what happens um, if you have a fast initial step and a slow second step. So the rate determining step being the, um, being the second reaction or the second elementary reaction. Let me uh, walk you through this example. So maybe I should have prefaced by saying, you know, what if, what if you have a fast initial step? Okay. What happens if you have a fast initial step? If you look at this reaction here, we have 2NO plus bromine gives you 2NOBr, okay? So we have this beautiful reaction right here, okay? And it says here that the rate law for this reaction is experimentally um, found to be the rate is equal to K times the concentration of NO to the power of two times the concentration of Br2. So it says here that because trimolecular processes are rare, trimolecular processes don't happen that often. I mean, the odds of three molecules all coming together simultaneously are pretty slim. So this suggests a two-step mechanism. So all we are, where we are right now, is we've looked at the reaction, we have a rate law, and there's something that suggests to us that it's a two-step mechanism, okay? So that means it's composed of two elementary steps. Okay, so that's all we are doing right now. This is just an example, okay? Example, nothing more than that. All right, and then we're going to uncover, you know, what we do here. Here's the proposed mechanism. You can see that the first step is fast, the second step is slow. So that tells you the second step is the RDS, right? It's the rate determining step. Nothing, you know, really tricky about that, that this is the rate determining step, okay? But something I want to draw your attention to is that we haven't seen an equilibrium arrow today, have we? Okay. If you back up, go all the way back to our problem, you're like, I'm not sure if I did or not, right? We had no equilibrium arrows. But when we look at this example, we do have an equilibrium arrow for the first step, the first elementary step in this proposed mechanism. All right. And we see that that step, again, the fast step is in equilibrium. So that means it's going to include the forward and reverse reactions. And then the rate determining step is going to be related to our 
reaction rate, right? Because we saw that the rate of reaction is going to depend on the rate determining step or the slowest step. So we already know that the rate of this reaction, let me use a different color, that the rate of this reaction is going to be equal to K times concentration of NO Br2 to the X times concentration of NO to the Y. And I'm just kind of backtracking with you here, just saying, okay, well, the slowest step, we know that our rate is going to be based on that, right? Okay, well, let's move on from there. It says here, if we look at these two steps again, okay, the rate of the overall reaction is going to depend on the rate of the slow step. We know that, but there's a problem here, okay? And this is what I had written out on the last slide, okay? What I wrote on the last slide, the last thing I wrote was this, okay? I said that the rate is going to be equal to K times concentration of NOBR2 times the concentration of NO. The problem with this rate law, okay? Does anybody see what the problem of, with the rate law is? Well, maybe that's a tough question. But the problem is this. If we add those two steps together, we can cancel the NOBR2, okay? Then our overall reaction is this. It's two molecules of NO plus bromine gives you two molecules of NOBR, like that. Okay, so if the rate law is directly related to the rate determining step, but this is my overall reaction and those are the reactants, where the hell is NOBR2 coming from, right? How would we find the concentration of NOBR2? Because it's an intermediate, right? It's got nothing to do with our overall reaction. It's produced in the first step and it's consumed in the second step. So the answer is we need to find a way to express this rate law, but we've got to eliminate NOBR2 because we don't see that in the overall reaction. So let me show you how you would do that, okay? First step is this. The NOBR2, it can react two ways. It can either react um, with NO, as is shown in the second step, to form some more NOBR, or it can decompose, right? It can go in this direction to give you NO and bromine. Okay, great. Well, the other reactants and products of the first step are in equilibrium with each other, right? Since we have equilibrium arrows here, that tells you that the rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the reverse, reverse reaction are equal, right? That's what an equilibrium is, right? When a reaction e reaches equilibrium, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. And this is kind of the key, okay? Because we can write an expression that express the rate of the forward and the reverse reaction for the first step, okay? So since the rate of the forward reaction, and this is for step one, okay? Since for step one, because the rate of the forward is equal to the rate of reverse, we can say that the forward, which is going in this direction, is equal to K1 times concentration of NO times concentration of Br2. It's an elementary step, so everything's to the power of one, okay? The rate of the reverse reaction is going to be equal to K to the negative one or K negative one. Okay, that just signifies that it's the reverse times the concentration of that reactant, right? We're talking about the reverse. Okay, well, now we can come up with an expression and we can solve for concentration of NOBR, which is what we're looking for because, sorry, concentration of NOBR2 because we want to plug that into here to get rid of that, right? Because it's an intermediate. We don't want to have an intermediate in our rate law. So if you divide both sides by K minus one, okay? These cancel and you end up with this expression right here. Now you have the concentration of NOBR2, your intermediate, and you can express it as concentrations of the reactants in the reaction that are in the overall reaction. All right, so we would just plug those in. So again, taking our taking our rate law, we plug this expression. So if you're wondering where I am, I'm plugging this expression right here and I'm plugging it into this expression right here, okay? So let me just get a pencil here for a second. So um, 
rate is equal to K2 times NO Br2 times NO. And then if we write that down here, okay, I'm just going to show you step by step in case you're confused. So we said that the overall rate of the reaction, the rate determining step was rate is equal to K2 times concentration of NO Br times NO, like that, okay? And then all we did is we plugged in this expression right here in for NOBR2, and we end up with this rate law right here. So the rate is equal to K2 times K1 divided by K minus 1 times, we got two NO, so that's going to be NO squared to the power of 2 times the concentration of bromine. And now we have the rate, and we've expressed it in terms of what? The overall reaction. If you don't believe me, let's prove it. Our overall reaction was 2NO plus Br2 gives you 2NOBr. Look what the reactants are in the overall reaction, NO and Br, and that's what we've expressed it in terms of. So that's a specific case for if you have a fast step being the first step of your elementary reaction. So we'll look at some more examples of, um, of uh, reaction mechanisms in the practice exam. But in the interest of time, I want to keep moving on from there. And I want to talk about catalysis, or I could have called this section catalysts. I mean, either way, it doesn't matter. Um, this is probably the definitely one of the shortest sections that we'll ever look at in this entire class because I could summar, summarize a catalyst for you very quickly. If we were to look at this slide right here, if we think about you know, what you learn in general chemistry one and what we've talked about in this class is if we have an endothermic reaction like this one here, we have some reactants, okay? And we talked a lot about activation energy and how we have to pass through a certain transition state, right? To, that um, we have to have enough energy to surpass the activation energy for a reaction. Well, what a catalyst is, is a catalyst is nothing more than something that we can add to the reaction mixture that doesn't get consumed by the reaction mixture, but it changes the pathway and it lowers the activation energy. Think about it. If activation energy is lowered, what's that going to do? That's going to increase the reaction rate because the barrier is going to be smaller. Now, if I backtrack here and go back to my first slide, there's a lot of information here, and I don't like reading, just, you know, reading off of um, a slide. But let's take a look at what it says here. It says the energy difference between reactants and products, right, the difference in energy between these two is a property of the actual chemical species themselves, and that's determined by thermodynamics. Again, that's something that we covered in general chemistry one, okay? Um, the difference between reactants and products, you can't change that by kinetics. It's got nothing to do with kinetics at all, right? That's thermodynamics. That takes us right back to the first slide that I covered in chapter 12, okay? So, um, if a reaction pathway that leads to an activated complex with a lower energy, um, the activation energy will be lowered and the reaction rate is going to increase. So, what we're doing is if we add a catalyst, all it does is it lowers the activation energy by changing the pathway. Again, if we have a lower activation energy, we're simply going to have a faster reaction rate. Nothing more than that. So somebody said, will we be told which step is fast or slow? Okay, so that's in the last section. Um, uh, yes, I would tell you which step is a rate determining step if you needed that information. Okay. Anyhow, so there we go. So that's the role of a catalyst is nothing more than to increase the rate of a reaction by lowering activation energy and it doesn't get consumed. It gets regenerated. And one of the things that's so great about catalysts in, you know, the 21st century is that if they're regenerated, that means they're recyclable. They can be reused over and over. And in a you know day and age when we're trying to find ways to run reactions without polluting the environment, um, catalysis is really attractive for chemists nowadays. All right. 
Anyhow, it says here at the bottom, last point, is that sometimes a catalyzed path contains multiple steps, but each step has an activation energy lower than the activation energy of the uncatalyzed reaction. So if you had several steps, okay, so you have, you know, this is step, get the green pen, you know, this is step one here, and then you have step two. Well, out of those two steps, who could tell me which one would be the rate determining step in the catalyzed pathway? And it's not a trick question. The first one. Yeah, the first one because it's got a higher activation energy. Nothing more than that. Let's look at an example. It says here two reaction diagrams here represent the same reaction. One with a catalyst, one without a catalyst. Estimate the activation energy for each process and identify which one involves a catalyst. So first we'll answer the second question. Could anybody tell me, is it A or B that involves a catalyst? B. It's definitely B, right? The activation energy there is much lower. Now the estimation, I just went to take a pencil and touch my iPad. But anyhow, the activation energy is gonna be the difference between here and here. That looks like what? 32 kilojoules minus what? Maybe around six or seven. So 32 minus seven. And this is just me kind of, you know, back of a napkin calculation here. So kilojoules would be the unit. So we take 32 and we subtract seven from it. So it'd be around what, 25? Around 25 kilojoules would be your activation energy. Whereas over here, you know, again, you're starting around the same seven and then you're going to 20. So it's 20 minus seven. So, and I should include my units. So it's gonna be around maybe 13 kilojoules here is equal to your activation energy. So again, the catalyzed pathway, um, all it does is seek to lower the activation energy, and that is it. All right. All right, there we go. All right, well, with that in mind, since I have posted the solutions to all the extra kinetics problems, what I thought we would do is we would take a look at the practice exam. So let me see here. Uh, let me try to find it. Where was it? Da, da, da. There we go. Go back here. Okay. Who wants to take a look at the practice exam? Anybody? Yeah, let's do it. All right, I agree. Let's do it. Let's look at the practice exam. So now you've covered all of the content for chapter 12. Uh, first chapter in general chemistry two. Here's a practice exam. You know, there's always somebody who asks me, is the practice exam the same as the actual exam? Well, I mean, that's subjective, you know. I think it's pretty similar. Did I make it so that you just memorize these questions and plug in the same numbers? Hell no. You know, I have to design it in such a way that you're encouraged to think and, you know, do some actual problem solving. Well, with that in mind, let's get to it. So this is your first practice exam. Now, I posted the solutions to Canvas. They're up there now if you want to just take a look at them. But I recommend, you know, going through all the problems one by one. And also, you can write the test using Respondus Lockdown Browser. So if you've never used Respondus before, I encourage you to try the practice exam using Respondus. That way, when you walk into the examination room on the actual exam day, you'll be ready to go. You'll know what to do. You'll be like, I know how to use Respondus. I know what it is. And um, you won't panic or anything like that. Okay, so let's get going here. So practice exam one, Mr. Dion. And I'm going to try to go through these problems a little slower so that we're, you know, if uh, anybody's having a hard time catching up, that you can kind of follow along with me here. Oops, I went right to the end. All right, well, let's get started. First question, imagine we're all in the examination room. It says for this reaction, BrO3 minus plus 5Br minus plus 6 protons gives you three bromines plus three waters. Um, for that reaction at a particular time, the rate of disappearance of BrO3 minus um, equals 1.5 times 10 to the minus two um, uh, molar molar per second, what is the rate of disappearance of bromide at the same instant? Well, first, why don't we write out an expression um, for what we're looking for here. Uh, what we know is that the rate of disappearance of BrO3 minus 
over time is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the minus 2 molar per second. I'll write it out like that. Okay, so that's what we're given so far. And we're also given a balanced equation. Now remember that rate of a reaction is always a positive number, right? And since we have a negative here, that means that this term here is negative. But when you take a negative times a negative, you get a positive, right? Now, since I want to find, I'm looking for the rate of disappearance of bromide over time. That's what I'm looking for. I need to write an expression that relates this and this, okay? So let's see how we would do that. And I'm going to move this out of the way. This is just what we're looking for. And the way that I would do this is I see that the stoichiometric ratio of BrO3 minus to bromide is 1 to 5. So that means I can write this expression. The rate of disappearance of BrO3 minus over delta T is equal to negative 1 fifth delta Br minus over delta T. And if you're wondering, you know, where did you get that from, Mr. Dion? Well, one of the first things we looked at is we said if we have A plus B gives you C, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself, C plus D, we said you would write an expression that negative 1 over A, change in concentration of A over time is equal to negative 1 over B times the change in concentration over time for B, which is equal to 1 over C times the change in concentration of C over time, which is equal to 1 over D times the change in concentration of D over time, okay? So that is a rule that you need to know. So now that we have that expression, we can simply isolate this term, what we're looking for. And how would we do that? We know that the rate of disappearance of bromide over time, okay, is going to be equal to five times the rate of disappearance of our BRO3 minus over time, like that, okay, the rate of our disappearance. So when we plug our numbers in, we get the, the change in concentration of bromide over time is going to be equal to um, five times the negative of, I put, uh, sorry, I should put the negative out here. It's five times the concentration, uh, negative 1.5 times 10 to the negative two moles per liter per second, like that. And we end up with what? 7.5 times 10 to the negative two moles per liter per second, like that. So there we have it. So that's the rate of disappearance of our bromine over time. All right. So remember, they're saying what's the negative of that. And since the disappearance is a negative number, it's going to end up with a positive rate. So we have 7.5 times 10 to the negative 2 moles per liter per second. So there we go. Question one. All right. Let's move on and take a look at question number two. It says for this reaction, C6H14. It gives us C6H6 plus 4H2. The change in pressure of hydrogen over time is found to be um, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 2 atmospheres per second, where delta P over, or sorry, the change in pressure of hydrogen is the change in pressure of um, hydrogen. So it tells us it's the change in pressure. And we can measure the change in pressure the same way that we could the change in concentration, okay? I'm not gonna go over that in detail. That's something that we learned in general chemistry, but we can derive an expression just using the same formula that we used here, but instead of using concentration, we can just use change in pressure. So nothing more than that. All right, well, let's take a look at how we would set this up. We have our beautiful balanced equation here, and we know that the change in pressure of our hydrogen over time is equal to 2.5 times 10 to the minus two atmospheres per second, like that. 
And we can derive an expression from our balanced equation that negative one over four change in pressure of hydrogen over time is gonna be equal to positive change in pressure of C6H14 over time. Now again, this number here, it's telling us that the change in concentration of hydrogen over time is found to be this number, right? But that's gonna have, we're gonna have to plug that in as um, um, a positive number because it's appearing, right? This is a product. So that's a positive number. So let's derive an expression for our change in pressure of C6H14 over time. We get the delta, sorry, I've already done that. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So we get that delta change in pressure, sorry, the change in pressure for C6H14 over time is going to be equal to negative one fourth of 2.5 times 10 to the negative two atmospheres per second like that. So then we get the, the change in pressure for C6H14 over time is equal to negative 6.2 times 10 to the negative three atmospheres per second. So again, one of the take home messages of this problem is that you can derive an expression when everything's in the gas phase um, for pressure, okay, using the exact same rationale that we did for concentration, okay, exact same thing. So nothing really new there. All right, let's take a look at question number three. We have a reaction. A plus two molecules of B um, gives you some products. It's found to have a rate law. Rate is equal to K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B squared. While holding the concentration of A constant, the concentration of B is increased from X to 3X. Predict by what factor the rate increases. So our rate is going to increase if we increase the concentration, right? That's something that we talked about when we discussed collision theory. We said as concentration increases, um, rate is going to increase. Well, let's write down what we know. We know that the rate of this reaction, so the rate law is rate is equal to the rate constant times A times B squared like this. Now, there are many ways that you could solve this problem. There's probably a lot of people who just solved this problem in their head. And there's no, I have no issue with that whatsoever. If you just want to solve this in your noggin, no problem. But why don't we say that when B is equal to X, why don't we call that our um, first reaction? And then when B is increased to three times as much, that's going to be our second reaction. So we're going to compare R2 to R1. Again, R2 is the one where we've increased the concentration of B threefold. So in the second reaction, R2, it's going to be equal to our rate will be equal to K times the concentration of A. I'm just going to give A a concentration of one, and I just chose that number arbitrarily. And I'm going to give B a concentration of three because it's going up three times. Then I'm going to square that. And the rate of the first reaction, okay, so this is R1, and then this is for R2. It's going to be equal to K times the concentration of one. Again, that's not changing, times the concentration of one squared. Well, you see that your K is going to cancel as will the number one. And we end up with our R2 over R1 being equal to three squared over one, which equals nine over one, which equals nine. So that means that if I increase the concentration of B threefold, the rate of the reaction is going to increase by a factor of nine. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that problem. Anybody with me on that one? Okay, good. Thanks, Violet. Great. Okay, now again, feel free to solve some of these problems in your head, okay? Um, I think that using mental math is a great thing in, um, in chemistry class. So Stephen says, why are they divided? The reason that they're divided is because we're trying to show a factor, okay? We're comparing. What's a factor? You're comparing these two reactions. Okay, if you wanted to just do this, if you wanted to just solve the problem this way, you said, okay, well, my initial rate is going to be equal to K times the concentration of one times the concentration of one squared. That's going to give me, let's say, if I just ignore my K, 
that's going to give me a rate of one. One times one squared is one. If you said for R2, it's going to be equal to K times one times three squared. If you ignore the K, because K is a constant for both of these reactions, it's going to be equal to nine. What's the difference, right? What's the ratio? Nine to one. So that means that the second reaction is going to proceed nine times faster. Does that help? Either way works. Either way is perfectly acceptable with this guy. All right, the idea is that we know that the order for each reactant, whether it's first order or second order or third order or whatever, that order is gonna have an effect on the rate of reaction. Okay, great, thanks, Stephen. All right, let's move on and let's try question number four. We did this question uh, or something very close to it earlier on in the class. We practiced determining units of K. I bet you there's some people in the class that have looked at enough second order reactions that they're like, Mr. Dion, I don't need to do any math here. I already know the units of the rate constant for a second order reaction, right? I'm sure that many of you have this memorized already. That's totally fine, okay? I have no problem with you memorizing um, the, the units of the rate constant. But if you didn't have that memorized, you would say, if the rate is equal to rate constant times concentration of A times concentration of B, then you know that K is gonna be equal to rate divided by concentration of A times concentration of B. Rate is gonna be measured as moles per liter per second, right? You see that everything here has seconds in it. And you have, moles per liter times moles per liter. That equals moles per liter per second squared, or sorry, um, times or, or moles per liter per second times molarity squared. What happens? This cancels, this cancels, and you end up with molar to the minus one, seconds to the minus one. There you go. And so the answer is, hey, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. You're like, no problem, Mr. Dion. I can determine the units of K. Even the ones, you know, if it's beyond zero first or second order, no problem. I can just figure that out pretty quickly. Okay, great. All right, well, let's look at a question that involves the method of initial rates. And tell you what, if we have time, if we get through the whole practice exam and we have time left over on Friday, why don't we go back and look at that big problem that dealt with the method of initial rates, um, the one that had three reactants. Anyhow. It says here, use this data to determine a rate law for the reaction shown below. Earlier on in this class, a student asked me, you know, while I was lecturing, a student said, you know, are you always going to give us a rate law for a reaction? Well, that depends. If you need to have the rate law, yes, I'll give it to you. If you have enough data to determine a rate law, then you're going to have to determine it. We know that our rate law is going to be rate is equal to K times the concentration of NO to the power of X times the concentration of H2 to the power of Y, right? These are our two reactants, but we don't know what the reaction order is with respect to NO. We don't know what the reaction order is with respect to H2, but we are going to use the method, the method of initial, initial rates to solve this problem. Okay, so what are we looking for? Well, I'm kind of reviewing the method of initial rates. The first thing we're going to do is let's compare these two experiments, experiment one and experiment two, because in this experiment, or these two experiments, the concentration of NO remains constant, but the concentration of H2 changes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide and I'm going to compare R2 over R1. All right. Now, R2, I know that the rate is 1.46 moles per liter per minute. For R1, it's the same. It's 1.46 moles per liter per minute. Okay, they're both going to be equal to K. Okay, that doesn't change. Now, in the second reaction, right, what's my concentration of NO? It's going to be 0 0.021 molar to the power of X. It's the same in this one, 0 0.021 molar to the power of X, what's my concentration of hydrogen, H2? Here it's 0 0.260 to the power of Y. And in number one, it's 0 0.065 to the power of Y. 
look at what cancels here. These units cancel. All of this cancels. Okay. If we take 1.46 and we divide it by 1.46, we get that R2 over R1 is equal to 1, which is equal to 0.26 divided by 0 0.065. So that's equal to around 4. That gives you 4 to the power of y. 4 to the power of what gives you 1? Who could tell me that? 4 to the power of what gives me 1? Zero. Absolutely. So y is equal to 0. So that means that our reaction is 0 order with respect to the NO. Now we need to figure out the reaction order with respect to the hydrogen, the H2. Now I'm kind of running out of space here, so maybe I'll just write this down again. We'll say, um, we'll just leave it at zero order. And I'm going to erase this because I'm running out of space. So now we're going to compare two other reactions in order for us to determine the reaction order of the, um, or sorry, zero order with respect to hydrogen. Sorry, you guys. Misha Dion's losing it. There we go. Zero order with respect to hydrogen. There we go. That's better. Nobody corrected me. So, anyhow, so it's zero order with respect to hydrogen. Now we need to figure out the reaction order with respect to NO. So, why don't we compare reactions three and reactions one? Because the concentration of H2 uh, remains the same and the concentration of NO changes. So, let's do that. We'll do R3 over R1. We get 5.84 moles per liter per minute, minute divided by 1.46 moles per liter per minute is equal to K times 0.042 to the power of X times 0.065 to the power of Y. I should include my units here, shouldn't I? There we go, divided by K, 0.04, sorry. 0.021 molar to the power of x times 0.065 molar to the power of y. Look at everything that cancels out. These cancel out. K cancels. And I'm left over with R3 over R1 being equal to 4, which is equal to 2 to the power of x. So that makes it second order. Absolutely. So x is equal to 2. And that means that it's second order with respect to NL. So that means that our rate is equal to K times NO squared, which is this one right here. That's it. Give me a thumbs up if that helps you on the method of initial rates. So do we leave off the zero order? Yes, because anything to the power of zero equals what? One. There you go. So there's no need to include it. Thank you. No problem. There we go. All right. There we go. Method of initial rates. So we get a little practice on that. Um, and let's try another one. And this one, I'm going to see if we can do this in our noggin. Okay. Let's see if we can do this one in our heads. See if, and, and if you're like, oh, Mr. Dion, come on. We're given a calculator. Why would you show us how to do things in our head? If you've read the entire chapter, which I'm going to assume you have, if you've read the OpenStax textbook, there are several examples in there that they actually walk through it, and all of the math was done mentally. So they didn't do anything in a the calculator. They just said, oh, this looks like four. This looks like a two, you know, solve for X, you know. So let's see if we can do the same thing here. We have a reaction. Okay, we have a beautiful reaction. We know that our rate law is going to be something like rate is equal to K times the concentration of S2O8. 2 minus times the concentration of iodide. This will be to the power of x. This will be to the power of y. Our rate law is going to look something like that, but we don't know what the order is. If we compare the first two experiments, you can see that the concentration of iodide doesn't change, but the concentration of S2O8 changes. If I take 0 0.076 and I divide it by 0 0.038, Hopefully you can see that that's a 2. And if I divide 2.8 times 10 to the minus 5 by 1.4 times 10 to the minus 5, that also gives me 2. That means that 4 
my S two O S two O eight two minus. Okay, that means that two is equal to two to the power of x, and that means that x is equal to one. So that means that the reaction is first order with respect to S two O eight. So we have first order here for S208. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. I just did it in my head. Okay, so we don't have to worry about the three iodine? No, because I'm comparing reactions two and one, and it remains constant. So if I take 0 0.06 and divide it by 0 0.06, I get one. All right, Thank so you. that's the method of initial rates. So now if we do the same exercise for the iodide, and we can pick whatever experiments you want, but I usually try to set myself up for success. If I compare reaction two and reaction three, you can see that here, this doesn't change. So using the method of initial rates, if I compare reaction two over reaction three, here I get 0 0.06 divided by 0 0.03, that gives me two. And if I do the same thing here, that gives me two, right? 2.8 divided by 1.4, that gives me two. So that means that for the iodide, same thing, two is gonna be equal to two to the power of y. So that means that y is gonna be equal to one. So that means that this is first order. Okay, so that means that my rate is equal to k times the concentration of S2O8, two minus times the concentration of iodide. And that's my final answer right there, which is right there. So first order with respect to both of them. Does that help doing some mental math for any of my students? All right, great. Now, hey, are you going to be able to solve all of these problems by mental math? I can't. So the answer is probably not. Maybe some of you are like human calculators, and that's, that's wonderful. I love it when my students are really good at mental math. But, it, you know, if you have to solve question six, and you have to do it just like we did question five, where you have to lay everything out in, in gory detail, you know what, that's not a crime. You're not gonna get arrested for that. So I say, proceed, my friend, keep going. You know, Do, do what works for you. If you are really strong at mental math, uh, um, you know what? So Autumn makes a really good point, okay? I think it's a valid point, Autumn. She says, when doing it in my noggin, it makes it look substantially easier than writing it down and going through all the steps. Um, Autumn, I, I tend to agree with you, okay? The only thing I would caution you on is when, you know, when it's not something that's easily divided in your head, well, then you have to know how to set it up properly, okay? Sound good? And I see that a lot of people are giving her a thumbs up, so that's great. You know, I'm really proud of my students, you know, that they're able to do this stuff by just looking at it. But if you need to double check everyone to feel good about yourself, do it, okay? By all means, do it. Always err on the side of caution, right? Anyhow, here we have some something a uh, question that deals with an integrated rate law. It says a certain first order reaction, A giving you B is 25% complete at 42 minutes at 25 degrees Celsius. What's the half-life of the reaction? Well, I'm gonna give you the formula for, uh, I'm gonna give you the formula for the half-life of a first order reaction, but it's not gonna be labeled. Okay, it's not going to say this is the half-life of a first order. No, you're going to see the equation and you have to be able to recognize it. Okay, so for a first order reaction, first order reaction, the half-life is going to be equal to the ln of 2 or 0.693 divided by k. So in order for us to calculate a half-life, we need to find what? We need to find k. So we need to do that first. So must, but must find little k, our rate constant. And you guys should know that the integrated rate law, again, I'll provide it. I'm not going to label it, but I'll provide this formula. You're going to see this formula on the handout, that the ln of a is equal to negative kt plus the initial ln of a. This is the first order integrated rate law. Well, if we're solving this for k, I'm going to rearrange this formula. k is going to be equal to the ln of the initial concentration of A, subtract the ln of the concentration of A after the certain amount of time, divided by T. 
Now it's telling you that the reaction is 25% complete. Now you can set this up however the hell you want, but what I chose is this. I said, okay, I'm gonna say my initial concentration of A is 1.00 molar, okay? If you chose two molar, if you chose 10 molar, if you chose a million molar, it doesn't matter because the concentration of A, if it's 25% complete, you're just gonna take that number and multiply it by 0.75. So if I lose 25% of one, if you have a dollar and you lose 25 cents, how much do you have left over? 75 cents. So I'm left over with 0 0.750 molar. So now I have these two concentrations and I have my time, 42 minutes. I have everything I need to solve for K, which is going to lead me to my rate law. Let's plug in some numbers. We have that K is going to be equal to the lawn of 1.00 molar subtract the lawn of 0 0.750 molar. When you take the lawn, the units are eliminated in this case. Divide that by 42 minutes like that, and you get that your K is equal to 6.8 times 10 to the negative three minutes to the minus one. Now, again, that's your K. How do you know you've done this right? Because you know that when you have a first order reaction, we went over this in class a couple of times already. We know that the K, the units for K in a first order reaction are simply the reciprocal of time. Okay, so we have our K. Now we've got everything that we need to calculate our half-life. Let's do it. Divide this up and we know that our T one half, it's gonna be equal to the ln two divided by 6.8 times 10 to the minus three minutes to the minus one. We should have two sig figs in our final answer. Um, and here in my answers, I have three sig figs, but anyhow, as long as it's close enough, anyhow, when you divide that, you end up with, I got around 101 minutes. It's definitely the best choice out of all of these. So the half-life is 101 minutes. And if you're asking me, hey, Mr. Dion, are you gonna have 101 minutes, 100 minutes, and 101.1 minutes, and 100.9 minutes? No. Okay, it is not my job to try to trick you. Okay, I don't like trick questions and trying to ruin my students' lives. The idea is that you're able to solve the problem, you get the answer, there's nothing else that's even close to 101 minutes, and there you go, there's your answer, just like that. Okay, all right. Oh, Brogan put a really interesting comment in here, and I agree with you, Brogan. I've run into the same problem myself. Um, in fact, I did that on one of the lectures where I said, you know, decreased by, you know. So Brogan says, be careful with percent complete and percent decomposed, okay? So if it's 25% complete, you know, and 25% decomposed, um, that would be the same, I guess. But if you had um, percent remaining, so that's what he's saying, percent remaining, you know, that's something else, right? If you only have 25% remaining, then you'd have 0 0.250 more. That's a good point, Brogan, and I appreciate my students give, bringing up good points like that. So, you know, um, we can just stop here for a second because we covered a lot of content already today. Let's just take a quick break. Look, if you are allowed to bring in a scientific calculator to the, to the exam, which you are allowed to do, okay, there is probably no one who is hearing the sound of my voice who can't, who can't do these calculations, who can't plug in a, log, a natural logarithm who can't press the divide button, who can't press the equals button. Everybody can do that, okay? Everybody who's hearing the sound of my voice knows how to operate a calculator. It's what? What's, it? What's the difficult part? It's being able to read this question and knowing how to set that up. That was something that we saw in general chemistry too, right? Think about limiting reactive problems. Those are problems that students can struggle with, you know? But really all they are is multiplication and division, nothing else. Okay, so it's a matter of being able to read the problem and interpret said problem. All right, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. Half-life of a first order reaction. All right, great. Well, we're really cooking with it here, so let's, let's keep going. We have another reaction, A gives you products. It's first order with respect to A. Look, you can start writing stuff down immediately. You can just say, hey, I know that the rate law it's going to look like rate is equal to K times A. It's first order. Done. Starting with an initial concentration of A, 
or sorry, starting with the concentration, yeah, initial concentration of 0.25 molar, it takes 45 minutes to uh, reach a concentration of 0.110 molar. What is the rate constant for the reaction? Look, you know that this is a first order reaction. Okay, this is directly analogous to our last problem where you have to know how to recognize the integrated first order rate law, which is the ln of the concentration of A is equal to negative KT plus the initial concentration of A like that. So if we solve for K, it's equal to the ln of the initial concentration of A, subtract the ln of concentration of A after the amount of time divided by T. So our K is going to be equal to the ln of 0 0.250 molar. I'm having problems writing the letter M. Ln of 0 0.110 molar. There we go. We divide all that by 45 minutes. Looks good because the rate constant should have reciprocal minutes. And we end up with, I ended up with 1.8 times 10 to the minus 2 minutes to the minus 1. So this is pretty similar to the last problem in that we had to calculate a K. So let's move on from there. And let's take a look at another problem. This uh, problem deals with, you know, some of what Brogan was bringing up, which was, you know, reading the problem and interpret it um, properly. Okay, so it says here, the isomerization of cyclopropane to cycle to propane, rather, follows first order kinetics. So right away, you know, this is a first order reaction. Um, at 700 Kelvin, the rate constant, so our K is equal to 6.2 times 10 to the minus 4 minutes to the minus 1. How many minutes are required for 10% of a sample of cyclopropane to isomerize to propane? Look, we've gone over this already. This is kind of like the third time we've done this. But we know that the integrated rate law for a first order reaction is the ln of A is equal to negative KT plus the initial concentration of A. Now we're trying to calculate time in minutes. So if we solve this for time, we get that T is equal to ln of the initial concentration of A, subtract the ln of the final concentration of A, divided by K. Now here again is what Brogan brought up. He said, if 10% of the, it says 10% of the sample of cyclopropane is isomerized. That means if your initial concentration, okay, if A0 is 1.00 molar, if 10% of it is isomerized, that means that only 10% of it is over here. That means you've still got 90% over here. So that means you're going to be left over with, at the time, you're going to be left over with 0 0.900 molar like that. Okay, so just interpreting the problem. So when we plug this in, we get that our T is equal to the ln of 1.00, subtract ln of 0 0.900 molar. The molarity uh, disappears, and we end up with, um, what's our K again? 6.2 times 10 to the minus 4 minutes. You have reciprocal minutes on a denominator, so that means that your T is going to be in minutes. And I did this one. You end up with 1.7 times 10 to the 2 minutes, right, which is the same thing as 170 minutes like that. You got to know how to uh, convert, you know, scientific notation in your head. Give me a thumbs up if you're feeling a little more confident now. If things are starting to crystallize in your mind a little bit, you're like, you know what? It's making more sense than it did two lectures ago. Yeah, absolutely. What you find with this class, and I've taught this class a minute ago, that the more practice we do, you know, you, you'll end up getting a lot more powerful. Um, somebody says, I feel so much better doing practice. Yeah. Okay, so let me stop recording here, and we got a little bit of time left. So let me just um, 